Fate and destiny are themes often explored in JRPGs, and in video games in general. As a medium all about directly controlling the actions on screen, it makes sense for video games to question what kind of agency players have over these created environments. Role-playing games inherently allow freedom of control. Control over your party of characters, the actions you take in battle, the items you gather, the world you explore. Yet, these games are also paradoxically linear and exist within controlled environments. No matter how much a developer or publisher promises unlimited choices and infinite possibilities, every game has its limits. Every player will experience the same beginning and the same ending, or at least the same variations on that. What changes is what journey they take to get there. So it's funny that so many linear JRPGs that focus on character development and storytelling love to explore themes of fate and destiny since the player can rarely deviate from the path set forth for them in the game. While the characters have control over their destinies by the choices they make in the game, players rarely get to control those choices themselves. Rather, they are simply along for the ride. So if the ride is about exploring the power of choice and rejecting destiny, you may as well have fun with it. Before anyone knew anything, about the Xbox 360. Not even its name, not even its shape, its size. We knew that Microsoft was going to produce JRPGs for it. In early 2005, Microsoft announced that it would publish the first two games from the newly formed Mistwalker Studios on the next generation Xbox. Mistwalker was a newly prominent name in the Japanese games industry as it was an independent studio headed by the father of Final Fantasy, Hironobu Sakaguchi. For a while, Mistwalker's games were set to be the next generation of JRPGs, and it seemed like the new classics of the genre would find their home on Microsoft's machine. As the world waited to see what Mistwalker and Microsoft had up their sleeves, a smaller and at the time unknown studio was ready to beat everyone else to the next-gen JRPG punch. Stop this! Remember who you are! I'm gonna finish this! A mere human seeks to stop me? Buried in his past lies the key to our future. Atsuma! While most Japanese studios remain loyal to Sony and Nintendo, a little studio called From Software decided to get real close with Microsoft and produce some exclusive games for the original Xbox. Out of this partnership came the Otogi games and most infamously, Metal Wolf Chaos. As producer Masanori Taguchi explained to Screen Rant, Metal Wolf Chaos came out near the end of the Xbox's life cycle in December 2004, and it would have taken 10 months for the game to be localized and released internationally. Rather than release the game on a soon-to-be-dead console, Microsoft suggested that From Software make a new game for the upcoming Xbox 360. That brand new game would become Enchanted Arms, which has the distinct honor of being the first JRPG to release on next generation consoles in Japan, Europe, and the United States. Released in early 2006 in Japan, and the rest of the world later in the summer of 2006, Enchanted Arms seemed to have a bit of hype surrounding it. Looking at E3 preview articles released at the time, many outlets praised the game's visuals and combat, but were wary about the characters and story. They also were surprised to see Ubisoft, who at the time were most well known for the Tom Clancy games, publishing the international release. Ubisoft themselves were positioning Enchanted Arms to be the next big RPG adventure from Japan. The trailer sells it as a grand and sprawling journey full of action and drama, all with cutting edge graphics. The previews seem to be reading from the same press release as they highlight the many side quests, engaging dialogue, and innovative combat system. This was meant to be the next great JRPG classic. Are you ready? Huh? What?
Where? What's going on? What games media and JRPG fans did not notice before release was the history of developer from software. While a beloved and internationally successful studio today, from Software started out as a cult favorite in Japan that had an even smaller fan base throughout the world. They released plenty of games on the PS1 and PS2, uh, most notably the Armored Core series. But before Demon Souls and the rise of Miyazaki, From Software was the farthest from a high caliber video game studio. I would recommend watching this video from Thor High Heels if you want to get a taste of their pre Souls output. Suffice to say, they were not mainstream, and they liked it that way. So imagine my surprise when I walked into my local used game store and found a JRPG for the Xbox 360 that I had never heard of. On top of that, it was developed by From Software and published by Ubisoft. How had I never heard of this? The back of the box promised a 50 hour RPG with over 100 characters to collect and an epic adventure exclusive to next gen hardware. Well, since it was only $8, I decided to buy it and eventually give it a try. In fact, this purchase is what sparked this video series in the first place. And having now beaten Enchanted Arms, I'm pretty happy I took advantage of that deal. While From Software's attempt at an HD traditional JRPG is anything but, it's still a charmingly janky Japanese game full of genuine charm bolstered by a superb combat system. The plot of Enchanted Arms is fairly standard on the surface. The game takes place in a fantasy world where an ancient war called the Golem War took place a thousand years ago. Golems are machines created by humans to carry out commands ceaselessly, even if the human giving the order dies. As you can guess, things got out of hand pretty quickly. While the Golems almost destroyed the world, one day they all simply stopped working. Now humanity has almost forgotten all about the conflict, with some even doubting its existence. Though nefarious forces are at work to try and rediscover the lost magic and techniques used to create the most powerful golems, called Devil Golems. The main plot focuses on Atsuma, a young man whose defining character trait is that he's dumb as a rock. I just get so drowsy looking at textbooks and reading about magic techniques. Ugh. That's just the way I am. As he gleefully fails upwards at Yokohama University, he is held up by his friends, the near-perfect Toya and the extremely dated walking stereotype Makoto. So it's Makoto's birthday. If you say so, Toya, from today on, today will be my birthday. I'll change my birthday for you. We'll get more into his characterization later. Soon after the game begins, Atsuma and friends accidentally awaken the Queen of Ice, a powerful devil golem held captive underneath Yokohama University. She soon lays waste to the entire city, kidnaps Toya, and seemingly kills Makoto. Atsuma is the only survivor of the attack, as the Queen of Ice plans to destroy the rest of the world. After escaping from prison, Atsuma begins his quest to save Toya, who is being controlled by the Queen of Ice. He's joined by Karen and Rygar, a princess and her defender, and Yuki, a money-obsessed golem hunter. They must travel across the land, visiting cities and towns, solving the problems they find, all while getting stronger and becoming closer as friends. It's a story you've heard before, if you've played any JRPG. But like all great stories, it's the beats along the way that make Enchanted Arms special. This is a game that loves its world and characters. The game world itself is linear, with directed pathways and hallways being your main mode of transportation. Yet within these cramped dungeons and wide open plains, there is some beauty to be found. Either in the unique designs of the ancient technology or in the tranquil nature found near Kyoto City. In general, each location you visit is unique and sprawling. The cities and towns all have unique architecture and styles, feeling like they have their own culture. Each town is also full of NPCs that you can talk to, and their dialogue changes every time a major story event happens. Some have many storylines while others swap out during each game milestone. When you first enter the starting city, I spent almost an hour talking to everyone and trying to interact with everything. It wasn't like there was a ton to do, but the dialogue was so much fun that it felt rewarding to explore these areas. Every NPC also has quirky or oddly specific names. There's 
Man always stuck at just friends. Bad egg likely to stay back a year, and many more. These names don't always play into what the character actually says, and instead seem like character traits that are intrinsic to these people. You may never get to know them beyond this conversation, but you can get a sense of how they live their lives just from these titles. They feel like they have lives outside of your interaction with them. As the NPCs have defining character traits, so too do the main cast. Atsuma is canonically stupid, yet hopefully naive. So Toya, do you know what day it is today? It's your birthday, right? That's right! Wait, no it isn't. Corinne is a sassy and tough fighter. How long do you intend to stay down there anyway? Look, you! Oh, uh, oh yeah? You want a piece of me too? Uh, no, actually. Ah! Rygar is stoic with a hidden past. As you say and Yuki is a money-obsessed gremlin. Think of all the money you could make with it. What was that? I'm talking about money. The game offers plenty of opportunities for the player to experience these traits thanks to its tons of cutscenes. Many are fully voiced, with the characters simply talking to each other or getting up to hijinks. While everyone does grow and change slightly throughout the story, they never lose their core essence. Atsuma may recognize the privileged and carefree life he has lived, but it never kills his optimistic spirit or makes him any smarter. Let's go! If possible, I'd like to master this art before tomorrow. Does he really believe that such a thing is possible? I hear that it can take many years. These strong personalities were a major point of criticism when the game released, but I found them endearing thanks in no small part to the voice acting. It's difficult to tell if the voice acting is poor or intentional. While I think the localization might have a bit of both going on, I think the choices in dialogue and performance are more intentional than not. While the plot is melodramatic and action-packed, the characters themselves are often presented as goofballs stumbling through their adventure. Come on, her? A female spy? Where's the sex appeal? The curves? Good point. Good point. Why you? Atsuma is especially guilty of this, often blindly running into danger and refusing to follow logical choices or commands. Because of this character choice, the often goofy voice acting feels more appropriate than not. In fact, I would argue the only voice actor that does a bad job is the voice for Atsuma, John Hawks. Out of the main cast, he has the least experience in voice acting and yet he has the most difficult job of making a deliberately obnoxious character likable. He also has to spend a lot of time pretending to be in pain, which is not one of his strong suits. The rest of the cast are experienced video game voice actors and they do a fine job. Not every line is read perfectly and small lines of dialogue were clearly recorded out of context, but they managed to sell the often ridiculously comedic dialogue. In fact, I would argue Enchanted Arms is meant to be taken as a comedy more often than not. The game takes many opportunities to set up comedic set pieces full of punchlines, running jokes, and even fourth wall breaks. It never takes itself too seriously. While it respects its world and characters, they're never too serious or dramatic to miss a chance to crack a joke. Your excuse! For what, Master? <sighs> For never contacting me after you left and then quitting the nights! My apologies. This is not much of a surprise, as the same leadership was responsible for the aforementioned Metal Wolf Chaos. Not every joke has aged well, though. And this is where we get into the Makoto problem. Makoto is a gay character. He is openly flirtatious, feminine, and sexually aggressive. He's a walking stereotype, but he's also a loyal friend with strong abilities who will do anything that he thinks is right. The issue is that Makoto spends the majority of the game disguised as someone else, playing a mysterious, traditionally masculine character who is referred to only as the handsome man. Pathetic. Nani? 
He stands in the shadows, helping Atsuma and friends reach their goal. He defeats strong monsters, gives them directions, basically moves the plot forward. He also serves as an ideological counter to Atsuma. Makoto is driven by his intelligence and reasoning, believing that there is a way to save Toya, even if it's still a tough choice. Atsuma, on the other hand, defies fate and goes against what he's told in order to find a solution. While Makoto has some of these great character traits, and it would have been refreshing to see an openly gay character in a 2006 video game, he unfortunately becomes the butt of the joke whenever he's not in disguise. This is seen pretty clearly when he reveals himself at the end. Spoilers for the end of Enchanted Arms, obviously. Atsuma cracks a joke about Makoto cross-dressing, to which he responds by saying that a lady could never do the violent and manly things he did throughout the game. I won't get into the implications for transgender representation or cross-dressing culture, since I'm nowhere near an expert, but the way it's presented in-game feels mean-spirited, which is definitely off-putting for a game that has been fairly light-hearted and celebratory of its character's weird traits. Not to mention, it's definitely gross that Makoto is handsome when performing as traditionally male, but when he's playing himself, he's not exactly handsome anymore. And just to put the homophobic cherry on top, the final joke and line of the game is Makoto sexually harassing Toya by forcing him to kiss him, taking his flirtatious intentions and taking them a step too far. This action is played off as a cute joke, despite playing into harmful stereotypes of homosexuality. It's uncomfortable and the main stumbling block for a game that seems to celebrate the weirdos and outsiders of society. While many critics and players at the time of release did not take to this goofy tone and bizarre voice acting and script, I would argue it's one of Enchanted Arms' biggest strengths. These bold choices give the story some spice, peppering occasional generic villain dialogue and teen angst with intentional and unintentionally funny moments. Plenty of scenes are memorable and help to make these characters feel more realized than in the more dramatic moments. From Software does an amazing job at making games that can be considered so bad they're good. While I don't agree with this cynical classification, their games do tap into that same emotion that makes films like The Room or Trolls 2 classics of midnight movie screenings. It's a similar emotion that is felt in many Japanese games, but is often overlooked in favor of the crazy action, appealing character designs, and cutting edge graphics of popular games from the country. That emotion is sincerity. Enchanted Arms is a game that loves its characters and world, and all it wants is to get you to love them too. Every character wears their heart on their sleeves, every villain is outwardly evil with little nuance or pathos to muddy the waters. The game is rarely mean-spirited and instead feels like a group of best friends heading out on an adventure to save the world. You know, some anime bullshit. But this anime bullshit is made even more sincere and endearing thanks to From's lack of resources at the time. They were a small studio pumping out games at a breakneck pace. According to a preview from IGN, they argue that From was able to quickly create this full-fledged HD JRPG thanks to their prior experience with the original Xbox. It's a game made with passion and love, and quickly released to the public not just to make a quick buck, but to try something new. At times, Enchanted Arms can feel like a dumb dog. Yes, they might not be as well trained as other dogs, they might not know when to stop eating, and they might run into the glass sliding door sometimes. But damn it, they're just so honest and endearing and sincere, it's impossible to stay mad at them. This isn't to say that Enchanted Arms is an incompetent game. In fact, I would argue it has one of the most fun and satisfying combat systems on the platform. Combat in Enchanted Arms is turn-based tactical, taking place on a 4x4 grid. Each character gets to move and perform an action, be it to attack, cast a spell, or use an item. Once your party goes, then the enemy gets a chance to counter. Unlike From Software's recent output, Enchanted Arms is very player friendly. You can save anywhere in the game when you're not in combat, you can retry every encounter if you die with no consequences for losing, 
and you can see every detail about your enemies and your health and EP are restored at the end of each fight. This game doesn't want to punish you, it wants to invite you into its world and easily get acquainted with the combat system. The combat has added depth thanks to a number of systems. First there's the elemental attributes, where every character has an associated element like fire, wind, water, etc. Yet individual attacks also have their own attributes, be they elemental or physical versus range. Each element has an opposing attribute that it's weak to, but those weaknesses go both ways. For example, fire is powerful against water, but water is also powerful against fire. Therefore, if you put your fire attacker on the front lines to fight a water-based enemy, you better be sure they kill in one hit or you're going to be in trouble. There's also the combination and EX gauges. Both increase throughout the battles and carry over into different fights. The combo gauge allows for combination attacks when multiple party members with a full gauge attack the same enemy. The EX gauge allows access to devastating attacks and powerful buffs. Landing a combination attack is always satisfying, and the EX moves are used to show the next gen tech with plenty of particle effects, motion blur, screen shaking, and controller rumble. In combat you have many options available to you, allowing for unique tactics that change depending on who you're facing. The most interesting choices come from one limitation that the game sets which is that there is no set party lineup. Whenever you encounter an enemy, your party always starts in random positions. This forces you to think through every fight, creatively dealing with the unique challenges presented in each battle. To further encourage you to stay engaged, every character has a VP stat. These points go down for various reasons during a fight, and once it reaches zero, that character will start each fight with one HP and one EP which are essentially your magic points. The only way to conserve VP is to finish your battles in one turn. It's an interesting system that encouraged me to think more strategically in the beginning, but became a huge nuisance in the late game during the optional dungeon. Enchanted Arms allows for plenty of customization in terms of skills that you can learn or buy, and your base stats, which you can manually improve by investing points into your parameters to boost them past what you learned from normal leveling up. There's also party customization thanks to the collectible golems found across the world. These monsters start off as some of the most exciting elements in the game. Their designs are unique and interesting, ranging from futuristic mechs, horrible abominations, and worst of all, cat girls. It's fun to buy new golem cores or encounter them in each area, learning their moves and roles in combat before crafting them for your own team. While an initially great hook, golems become mostly obsolete halfway through the game once you've assembled your main party. They can't learn any new abilities and become mostly situational near the end of the game. Ultimately, it makes more sense to level up your main party, who are more versatile and can learn new skills. While it's still fun to see what crazy designs the developers came up with, they stop being useful in combat and are mostly used to conserve your main party's VP until you find a stone to replenish it. Another issue is the encounter rate, which can often feel too frequent. I will admit I'm probably a bit spoiled by modern RPGs uh, allowing players to choose who they fight, but the random encounters became especially annoying in the later half of the game, while I was trying to wrap up the extra content and acquire the most powerful weapons in the game. But just like that dumb dog from before, I can't stay mad at Enchanted Arms for long. For every annoying random encounter, graphical slowdown or glitch, or odd voice acting choice, there's always something else to win me over. Be it the endearing characters, the earnest attempts at comedy that are funny whether they fail or succeed, or the truly interesting world and attempts at creating a unique setting. I also found a lot to love about the themes explored in the game. Enchanted Arms is a game about control. Humans control golems, who are given a set purpose and endlessly follow it. At the same time, the game shows time and time again that most humans are no different. Humans are often controlled by others in power, while those in power are often controlled themselves. Just as golems are doomed to repeat their actions long after their masters are dead, humans are doomed to repeat history. Even when the ones who set the plan in motion are dead, their actions still have consequences that can be felt even a thousand years later. 
the main cast have been manipulated by those in power, either willingly or unknowingly. Plans that have boiled underneath the surface for decades often impact our party's lives in surprising ways, forcing them to question their own fates and destinies. Atsuma himself is often told to follow his fate, that his life was decided for him before he could even make his own choices. One of the main conflicts near the end of the game is trying to find a way to save Toya without killing him. Despite seeming impossible, and with everyone telling him it's fate and destiny that Toya must die, Atsuma refuses to believe it. Rather than give in to what he's told and blindly follow others, he instead relies on hope and resilience, believing that there has to be another way. These themes are nothing new, and in fact I would bet good money that there are games that have explored this topic with more nuance and depth. But after spending over 40 hours with these lovable goofs, exploring this wide world and taking down the evil villains terrorizing each city, it's hard not to feel emotional when the world is saved thanks to the power of friendship, believing in yourself, and ignoring destiny and fate to set your own course. Enchanted Arms is a special game. It's not a perfect game, it's not innovative, and it definitely hasn't aged well in many places. But it's made with that From Software charm that adds layers of intrigue and sincerity, making it hard not to love. All cynicism must be left at the door when playing this game. Allow yourself to be taken away by the world, the characters, and the humor. You may not be able to control where the journey goes, but you have the choice to experience this game and accept it for what it is, some sincere anime bullshit.